Remembering Sophia, Psychology After the Red Book. In our Saturday morning session last month, I talked about Hillman and Giegrich and the issue of theology in relationship to Jungian psychology. And it really was the lecture I found most interesting to, to write. I titled it uh, Hillman, Giegrich, and Post-Jungian Theologics. And I thought that was an amusing, nerdish, and obscure title, and that it might pique some curiosity. Well, you know, as I told you, I I put these lectures up on the web page, and I I can check reports and see how many people are, 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 you know, listening to them. Uh, And that lecture was getting hardly any downloads at all. It was just the wet dog. Hillman, Giegrich, and Post-Jungian Theologics is apparently not a title that begs for more. And I couldn't figure out whether it was the word theologics or Giegrich. (laughs) That was the wet dog. Whichever. So this time as an experiment for tomorrow, I, I titled one of the lectures... Sex and Sophia. Um, And I was completely unsure when I made up the agenda what I was going to talk about. But I wanted to see if the title would generate a more robust interest than Hillman, Giegrich, and Post-Jungian Theologics. I I saw it as sort of a psychometrics or a psychosexual metrics, theological metrics of, uh, of human interest. And in that ill-titled seminar, which really does deserve a hearing, I told a story. And I'll, I'll tell it again. Ruth told a bit of it in the introduction. I told last time, and I'll tell again, that last summer in August, <coughs> I had uh, been trying to read Giegrich, and I, I decided I'd go out to the desert, where I do have a place. I have a rock uh, way the hell out in the southern San Rafael Desert. It's No one else goes there. It's a little desert track, and you go 40 miles in the middle of nowhere, and it's someplace out there. That's where my place is. It's beautiful. And so I went out there to read Giegrich, and on the second night I was out there in the desert reading. I went to bed in my little desert tent all alone, and I had a dream. The dream was that three figures came up over the horizon of the desert. There was a man and two women. And the man was in the middle and there was a woman to each side. And the women looked like uh, zombies. They, and the association I had in the morning is that they looked like uh, models on a, on a uh, fashion runway. You know, this completely blank, emaciated look. And the fellow in the middle was rather thin and had a, a little black beard and they came up to me came before me not right directly in front of me but they were a bit away and the man said to me we have come for your dead and I immediately felt defensive I felt something was that this was a battle and in the dream my response was is that you will not have my dead you will not have my dead. And in the next scene in the dream, battlements were being set up. Uh, trenches or, or, or posts of defense were being set up. It was like a World War I battlefield. And at that point, I knew I was about to enter a major confrontation, and I awoke. And I said last month that I, that I awoke in fear, but it wasn't really fear. It was more agitation. <clears throat> this was an, a, a rather unusual dream. I don't have dreams very often that are so intense that they awaken me from sleep, still sort of shaking with the energy of the dream. It's not something that happens to me very often. So, you know, I said last, last time that telling a dream to a, a room full of shrinks has its dangers. And, and first among them is that they may recognize that you really are crazy. But despite that obvious danger, telling 
A dream also is a process of deepening relationship with image, with the dream. Uh, it pulls it back into consciousness. It makes you further consider it. And that's one reason, I suppose, it helps to, to tell dreams to people. When I told you that dream last month, I had not written it down, and I'd really not told it to anyone else. But it was still then and remains still now quite clear in my memory. Originally, I had associated the male figure in the dream, as I, as I mentioned last month, with Dr. Giegrich. But there was another association. This is the last painting in Jung's Red Book. Uh, he did it around 1930, and he never finished it. If you look at the figures, you can see some of them are more sketched in, some of the coloration is done, and some of it is not. After he did this picture, he really ended his attempt at transcribing Liber Novus, his manuscripts, into the big red folio volume we call the Red Book. And you'll see a, a figure there. This little figure. Originally I'd said I'd thought the figure was reminded me of the only picture I had seen of Dr. Giegrich. But I have thought a lot about this particular picture and that particular figure in the picture. And I realized that um, that that association was there as well. And that was the only picture I'd seen of Dr. Giegrich at the time of the dream. It was on a cover of a book or something I think I'd seen. Later in the day, in our last seminar, at lunchtime, I was sitting with some people and they asked me for my associations about the dream. And in those comments, some new impressions surfaced that made me dig a bit. And so tonight, I find that I, I have to talk about that dream. That dream in the desert of the dead. And this, of course, is not an analysis of the dream, not an attempt at an analysis. But that event did pull some of these materials into a new light. Now, I told you that the dream came in August. And after our talk last month, I reflected more about that particular time of summer and my response. Summer is a time uh, when memories of our dead can be near us. In, in Utah, there's this thing called the Decoration Day, known to the rest of the world as Memorial Day. And people go to the cemeteries on Decoration Day, Memorial Day, and they decorate the graves with flowers. My aunt um, had done this all of her life. And she, tells, she told me, I used to go there on Memorial Day with her, with my dad. And she, they would have to go and clean the graveyards because the graveyards were just weeds. They'd go and clean the graves and prepare them for the day and then take flowers. And I went to that graveyard with her. And now she's in that graveyard too, dead. But more recently, three years ago, someone very dear to me died in July. And that was also, is also, the month of her birth. And I realized that in the last couple of years, summer has been a time for memories of the dead. That's not so unusual, is it? Anniversaries of the death of loved ones often trigger memories. Over the years, I've seen many people who come in at that period of time really overwrought by memories triggered by anniversaries. But for me, it was never overwhelming. It wasn't overwhelming. I had not found it oppressive. It was just a time, a time of memories. Some of them were fond memories. Some were sorrowful. Of course, there were moments of sadness, but that's just life. One reflects. One remembers. So yeah, I considered the dream at that most personal level. My dead. Was the dream about these memories of summer? The dead I have known the dead I had seen depart from life. And those were my first questions there in the morning when I woke up in the desert and watched the sunrise and thought about it. But it seemed that was not it. That was not the affect. It was not the image. 
The sense was of a multitude of dead and not only of my own. Something more was being demanded of me by that dream in the desert. Something was being demanded of me from those visitors. Their demand for the dead was as if the dead were to be eradicated, taken from memory, denied, made as if they had not been, as if they were not part of my life, my heritage, and my humanity. And that I would not accept. I was defensive, and I would defend against that. So I've been out in the desert reading Giegrich, Dr. Wolfgang Giegrich. And I associated Dr. Giegrich with that male figure in the dream, the one who had come with the two women. And now I've shown you this other picture from the Red Book, which actually is a, a firmer association in some ways, more strongly in my association. I should also explain that before I went out in the desert last August, I'd already been reading Dr. Giegrich. Among the things I had studied was his review of Jung's Red Book, Liber Novus, which was published in the journal Spring in the fall 2010 issue. Though a relatively obscure figure, Giegrich is a polarizing voice among those with a, focus, a focused interest on Jung's work. He is a necessary and a useful voice a defining voice, and I'm really very glad he has appeared and so intelligently presented his viewpoint. It is a point of view, however, which I find entirely alien to the core of C.G. Jung's work. Giegrich helps us define and understand what Jung was driving at with his psychology, but he does so by providing a starkly contrasting understanding or misunderstanding of psychology and Jung. Nonetheless, I know he will hold the interest and allegiance of some people, and maybe eventually a very large number of people. His point of view may win the day in the eyes of history, as correct, but it will not do so unopposed. If anything, Giegrich is helping us focus on what Jung was about, what he was up to, and what we perhaps have been up to these many years without really knowing it. As is probably apparent to most of you by this point, I consider the Red Book to be one of the most important primary documents in the history of psychology. I think it is the foundation of Jung's work, and I believe it will have substantial repercussions on the coming understanding of 20th century psychology. Giegrich holds diametrically opposed views about this. But then, in historical analogy, gnosis is heresy to logocentrism, and it does evoke responses. Every Valentinus finds a Tertullian. Let me share a few snippets of what Giegrich's review of the Red Book said. And it's a long review. It's, it, it's about 50 pages long. It's certainly the longest review I've ever seen published in a journal. And I'm, again, grateful that they published it all because it helps make lots of things clear. I'm going to abstract comments from that review in sequence. He re opened his declaration with these words, and I quote, Jung's Red Book is exclusively his, neither for all nor none. It has no message to be shared, communicated. It has no message to be shared, communicated. Then after several pages asserting that the book should never have been published, he continues, and I quote, Now that the Red Book has been published, after all, it can nevertheless not become public property, like other books. Its style is contraceptive, fundamentally self-contained, like a tempest in a teapot. It cannot, indeed, ought not reach the reading public. End quote. 
When I read that, I remember the, the story that Dr. David Miller told about how he had taught this class at Pacifica on Gigrik, and at the end of the class, the students wanted to have a beach party and burn Gigrik's book. <laughs> well, tit for tat. Gigrik wants to ban or burn a book too. Jung's book. A book that should not reach the reading public. Who bans books? Who bans books? It's heresy we get rid of. And it seems that heresy is what Jung is to Gigrik, and it seems like heresy is what Gigrik is to some Jungians. The issue bugging Gigrik comes down to Jung's approach to fantasy and to image. Jung allows to fantasy a reality of its own. Jung met fantasy. He experienced it as a thing. He did not create it out of his thoughts. He met it. But Gigrik insists differently, and he states, and I quote, Ultimately, Jung's concept of the psychic truth boils down to sheer, overwhelming, brutal power. The unshakableness of the experience, as Jung called it. Jung is here a positivist. His word truth has nothing to do anymore with truth in its authentic sense. Authentic sense. End quote. A positivist. What does he mean? For Jung, fantasy has reality, all its own, met in experience, and psyche is real. It has positive reality. Gigrik continues, Because the event of overwhelming experience is what really counts, he, Jung, could not release the fantasy substance into logically being fantasy, having the form of fantasy being art. The soul is by definition deprived of its being of conscious structure or its being thought. Its being thought. End quote. For Gigrik, the soul is all thought. Fantasy is really all thought stuff. To be sublated by reason, pulled back into reason. But fantasy in Jung's view is an experience of a reality. It is something independent of logic's singularity. However one conceptualizes about the experience, we do meet image. We do have fantasy. And these are psychic facts. But to Gigrik, and I continue quoting, quote, It, the Red Book, is a work of speculative thought. Thought. However, not presented in the form of thought, but sunk into form of and disguised as spontaneous, immediate experiences and their interpretation. End quote. So Dr. G claims Jung is deceiving us, disguising facts with his embrace of fantasy, with his phony thought up visions and fantasies. He did not see anything except his own thought. It is all one, not two things in relationship. Gigrik asserts, We are psychologists. We must not be deceived by this superficial impression stated for a particular purpose. We could call the process that unfolds in it, the Red Book, wishful thinking, in the strict literal sense of this phrase. End quote. And thinking, of course, is a very important word to Dr. Gigrik, along with the words reason, logic, and truth. Or at least truth in the authentic sense. Jung's truth, he says, is not authentic truth. Jung's visionary journey, his imaginal experience, is all, in Dr. G's view, veiled thought. Jung just doesn't know how to think or logically digest these things as having been thoughts. Again and again, Gigrik restates this 
as if by repetition, by speaking bombastically and loudly, he can confirm the truth of his own words. Two pages later, he again repeats, It is a work of thought, speculative thought. It is not primarily a work of spontaneous inner experience. It is not a work of spontaneous inner experience. What it really is about is religion and metaphysics. End quote. He says the Red Book is not a work of spontaneous inner experience. If the Red Book is not such a thing, one wonders if Dr. Giegrich allows there is such a thing at all. Later on, he calls it a work of theosophy. Theosophia. And then he makes some summary declarations. It, the Red Book, is not psychology. Not a contribution to psychology as theory. But only psychic raw material. Psychology, by contrast, in its logical form, inevitably belongs to the generality. In it, that is, in true psychology, universal reason is addressed. End quote. Universal reason. And, of course, that thought is very Hegelian. This was Hegel's mystical absolute. Universal reason, logic the logical form of a theory. These are truth, but not, not image, not fantasy. These are false. And so I'd ask you, recall that myth, that Gnostic myth that I talked about, the first act of that Gnostic myth as I related to you last month. The eye opens. He saw she was present with him. It seems that for Dr. Giegrich, it's all about he. There is no her, no she, no fact of relationship. Jung is substituting image for the singularity and purity of logical, spiritual truth. Thalo logocentrism. Giegrich's he only wants relationship with more he. Quoting again, Jung's substitution of image for spirit and truth is of course a most momentous move. It amounts to a programmatic attack on the logos. It, on principle, opens the way for the positivity of image, that is, for Jung's naturalistic stance, for the mere factual event of the emergence of an image as the successor of truth. End quote. It's an attack on logic. It opens the way for image. A naturalistic stance opening the way for event of image as a successor of truth. Truth. This is an attack on Giegrich's truth. Jung is attacking the supremacy of logic, which is, for Giegrich, a spiritual truth. Spirit and truth. By affirming image, by embracing the independence and relational fact of seeing her, seeing the other, the primal conception, Jung has betrayed the purity and singularity of Logos. This is Giegrich's monotheistic purity. And then he moves on. I mean, it's 50 pages long. This stuff is repeated again and again and again in this long, long review. He says, The thinker Jung thinks the departure from the inwardness of thought proper and replaces it with the factual experience of images. This idea of the union of opposites is nothing less than a fundamental attack on logic itself. 
As psychologists, we are well advised to disassociate ourselves from the Red Book and instead base our work on Jung's published psychology and critically so at that. End quote. And so Gigrick is willing to critically engage Jung's conceptual work, the precepts, which he then also <coughs> critiques. But he's not willing to look at the experience, the perceptual fact that was foundational to them. In response, in response 50 years in advance, Jung actually said what he meant. Jung wrote in 1957, Our time is congenitally charged with the attainment or completion of the Christian epic, namely with the supremacy of the word, that logos, which the central figure of Christian faith represents. The word has literally become our God and remains so. End quote. The word. The word. Gigrick is dealing with logos. The word. And it is a force at the end of this age, this Christian epic. A last thrusting of it. In tune with the completing of Christian theologics, logos and reason remain the singular absolute or God fact or spirit and truth for Dr. Gigrick. For Dr. Jung, Logos and Sophia were in relationship. They were wed. Look at that picture in the Red Book. I've heard many people try to talk about this or imagine what's going on. Generations and generations and generations of humankind reaching back to Stone Age figures. And then this mystery, this fact, this light, this star, this flower. Some are looking towards it. Some are ignoring it. Some are looking away. And if one looks at these faces as Jung conceived them, if you let your imagination play, you can actually pull out historical voices of the dead, of the past. And if you look at the picture, there's one figure here that has a rather peculiar nose, very much like the nose of Dr. C.G. Jung. And what's he doing? He's looking towards that mystery. In the past, when I looked at the picture, when I saw him paint this figure right beside him, looking strongly and rejectingly away from this mystery, I had wondered if he had been trying to indicate Sigmund Freud. And, of course, from the ages, many, many people are looking, some towards, some away, some violently away. The mystery. The mystery of a thing in life. An image and not a thought. And then this slide. This is Sapientia, Sophia, Wisdom, in the Red Book, painted around 1924, about six years before that last image. There she is up on the altar. And you look, some people are looking at her. Some people are, it seems, agitated and complaining about her, and there are some people turning their back and trying to ignore this mystery. This mystery that has appeared on the altar. I have reflected. Did these sorts of arguments made by Dr. Giegrich enter in to that dream I had in the desert? Was that what I was rejecting? defending against. I had read some of those words before I went, although I hadn't thought about them as deeply as I have now. 
The figures in the dream said, We have come for your dead. Is human experience of psychic reality, of soul substance, even the fact of my dead, the thing these dream figures wished to take? Was that what I was ready to fight against? And you may feel free to diagnose a resistance if you wish, because I do resist this. And I do it in full awakeness and in full consciousness, not just in a dream. Look, I'm revealing here some of my reflections and experiences and images and conclusions. But there are more, and I will share them. Another thought image came to me last summer. And I don't remember exactly when it was, but I sat pondering it several times out in the summer night. And these are the words that came to me. We are haunted. And we must face the fact. Pulling up the covers and pretending we do not know it does not make it go away. It will not go away. The dead surround us. They live with us. We need to give them our consideration, our attention. We are haunted. Night after night, last summer in various ways, in late summer, I thought about those words as I sat out. I pondered that phrase, we are haunted. What was this image? This was more than just a memory of my dead. Though, of course, I looked at that fact also, among other things. I also related the words to my recent study of Jung's Red Book. And this was an issue that ran to the core of Jung's vision and work. And I had understood that long before I read the Red Book. People speak of Jung's psychology as, as, as depth psychology, as analytical psychology, or more recently as archetypal psychology. But you know what Jung preferred to call it? Was complex psychology. It was complex, but the complexes were really the most easily accessible and readily understandable part of his psychology. And, and I suppose that, that most of you have dealt with complex psychology as a, as a theory. Let me just tell you a little bit about how that came about. This was the core of, of Jung's practical psychology. Around the early 1900s, Jung had uh, developed a thing called the word association tests. And this was not entirely new to Jung. But Jung started taking word associations and hooking people up to uh, what was called a galvometer, a, a measurement of skin resistance. They developed a list of 400 and then cut it down to 100 words. And they would say these words to the subject and hook them up to wires and measure their skin resistance. And they would also measure their breathing rate. And they had a big drum that rolled around with little needles that would show the skin resistance and the rate of their breathing. This was actually the prototype of what later became polygraph, a lie detector. And then they would do the word association test. Jung developed this. I mean, he was experimental. And so in 1903, 1904, they were doing this. And they would say the word, and they would see how long it took the person to come up with the association in time, what changes there were in skin resistance, what changes there were in breathing rate or depth of breath. What Jung saw is that some words affected people in a certain way, and that you could take patterns of these words, if you looked at it, and get ideas about things that were important or hidden in their unconscious, things that they did not even know about. And he called these things complexes, things in the unconscious that affected not only our skin resistance, the blood flow in our hands, our breathing rates, the amount of time it took us with consciousness to come up with an association, these were things in our unconscious. 
complexes. And we all have our complexes. These complexes do haunt us. They are things that go bump in the night. And they seize us with fear, with rage, with sorrow, and sometimes with stone-cold silence. Images of the dead are among them. But the recent dead, our dead, whom we knew in life, are not the only ones. It keeps moving backwards, deeper into the past, into the nature of our humanity. And the dead do bring stories. Jung found that myths themselves, stories of great antiquity, seem also to be complexes. The dead come in figurations with stories. They appear in dreams and fantasies. And they can seize us, they can hold us, and they need our conscious engagement. Well, okay, those were the thoughts in my mind, and then came another synchronicity. I was looking for a book on um, Amazon.com. I think it was in early September. And while I was looking for the book, I ran into the title of another new book. It was by Jim Hollis, James Hollis. The title of the book was Hauntings. Hauntings. Dispelling the Ghosts Who Run Our Lives. I was involved in my own thoughts on the subject, and I really didn't want, I didn't want to get the book. I didn't want to read the book. I wanted to think about what I was thinking about, undisturbed with, by somebody else's ideas. Stay with my own thoughts a bit longer. And then sometime after November 2nd, All Souls Day, the book came back to mind. And I began wondering what Hollis did have to say. I'd pretty much completed my thoughts on the issue. I'd written some things down that I thought I might even use in this, in this seminar. And so I ordered it. Got it around the end of November. And when I read the book, it was a, a sense of deja vu all the way through. Here again were the things that had been working in my own thoughts for months... Hollis touched on many of the issues I had been considering in solitude. And I recommend it to you. It's a beautifully written book. Perhaps one of the finer possible introductions to Jung's complex psychology. Over the fall, I had thought about many of these things. But Hollis says it better. And so I just want to read you, share with you, a few things that he said. Some passages from the book. Things that resonated with me. Hollis opens with a quotation from Ibsen's 1882 play, The Ghosts, explaining that Ibsen had felt, and I quote, that his Oslo contemporaries were governed by invisible presences, dead ancestral influences, dead values, and dead scripts to enact. And thus he has one of his characters say, and now we quote from the play, I'm inclined to think that we are all ghosts. It's not only the things that we've inherited from our fathers and mothers that live on in us, but all sorts of old dead ideas and old dead beliefs and things of that sort. They're not actually alive in us, but they're rooted there, all the same. And we can't rid ourselves of them. End quote. Have you ever had that feeling? Have you ever had that feeling? They're rooted there in us. It can be a mood as well as the thought. You know, when I gathered the images for that last lecture series I did last month, there is this picture by Mark Chagall, the fiddler on the roof, one of many pictures he did of the fiddler. And I wanted to use this image But I didn't know where the hell it fit in the lecture. I hadn't the slightest idea. Except it seemed to fit. And so finally, as I 
put the images for the lecture together the night, really the night before the lecture, I just threw this in as the first slide and the last slide. The Fiddler on the Roof. What did that have to do with remembering Sophia? And as I looked at Chagall's painting eventually, I became aware that I was remembering a melody and opening lyrics from the 1960s musical, Fiddler on the Roof. I was silently hearing it. And I hadn't seen this show in 30 years. I still haven't. But I was remembering a word from the libretto, a word repeated. Tradition. 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 It means the thing handed on. The thing received from the human past. The word implicitly includes tradition as a thing conveyed by mouth to ear, by touch of hand, by eye looking in eye by life to life. It is a legacy of our humanity. The Hebrew word Kabbalah or Kabbalah means the tradition. Kabbalah is the tradition of the tradition. A tradition of experience, of image and story. And the story of the Shekinah was part of that tradition as was the story of Sophia. Sophia, too, was a source of that tradition. When we speak about tradition, we often do so as if it were a fact mired in in the past. We live in this age of stupefying change. Tradition is dead things. Things, things that seemingly have little relevance to our time, to our individuality. They're ghosts of the past. And traditional societies are, of course, now becoming a thing of the past. Facts for anthropological history. They're anachronisms. We moderns have freed ourselves from tradition and the outmoded semantics of bygone voices. The modern voice speaks from the ground of present-day society. And that place is no longer traditional. Or supposedly so. Tradition is the former and not the future. But we carry human legacy with us. It may go deeper than we allow. And Jung recognized it went far deeper than contemporary society seems now willing to accept. It is part of our nature, our psychology, and our relationship with the mysterious fact of life and of death. We have our past, our dead, and they haunt us. Bidden or not, they still bring us their living questions. They come with the wealth and burden of all humanity. What are we to do with tradition? The fiddler that keeps fiddling on the roof. We hear him at the distance, in the night, in the day. Who are they that still live, though they be called dead? Do they possess us? Do we possess them? Do we share something with them? Do we need give them recognition? Hollis continues in his book with his own meditations. And he states later on in the book, and I'll read, I quote, Any of us can be readily possessed. And only when we remember that the invisible world is not only real, but is driving the visible world. Our ego thinks is real. 
can we regain purchase on a conscious perspective? Such spirit states are real, psychological, but it matters how we understand them. To fail to, fail to understand them as psychic states, energies, to which the ego is prey, is to be at their mercy, to be living unconsciously, to be in the grips of the same malignant powers for which our ancestors devised such elaborate rituals, exorcisms, and apotropaic gestures. Apotropaic, warding off evil. Apotropaic. And when I read that, something in it rubbed me wrong. He said, he said, psychic states, he said we fail to understand them as psychic states. And when I read that, I wondered, is that, are they just psychic states? Just. Are they just? Putting emphasis on the word just psychic states. It seemed conceptual. It seemed like a box, a term as opposed to an experience. But he had more to say. Hollis continues. To pay conscious homage to the thread of multi-generational voices which run through us, to know that much of what we do on a daily basis is in service to a spectral past, is to light a candle in the darkness of being, which is what Jung concluded is our central task. Such a mindfulness tells us on a daily basis to reflect, to sort and sift, to ponder, to acquire the discipline of discernment. Thus we are obliged to ask troubling but necessary questions. What is that energy in service to, really. As a psychological confession rather than a metaphysical assertion, we would have to say that there are ghosts and that we walk amid them daily. A continuing reflection on such spectral presences not only is the requisite task for the conscious conduct of life, it may well provide a less divided sensibility and a richer passage through these twin worlds we inhabit at all times. Through these twin worlds we inhabit at all times. The past is not gone. It is not even past. And it is the task of this moment to discern how these worlds these worlds meet and infiltrate with each other. The truth is unsettling. If we are to recognize the powers of the invisible world, however, however understood, then we have to broaden and deepen our view of our lives continuously reassess our values and make more difficult choices. We have to embrace a psychology that goes deeper than behavior modification and cognitive reprogramming. If we open to this possibility of an invisible, dynamically active world. We then live in mystery anew, a prospect both inviting and daunting to the power-driven, comfort-seeking agendas of a dilatory consciousness. Those are James Hollis's reflections, not mine. But they came in synchrony to similar thoughts I had last fall after that dream in the desert. They were part of the imaginal flow that I was forming 
and reading Hollis actually helped. And I highly re- recommend his book to you. Hollis, Hauntings. But, of course, there is more. There is more. That whole contemplation. That dream. All dancing in the desert. And all this came together synchronously for me last summer. And it kept echoing in my thoughts throughout the fall up until tonight. Things I was trying to put together all part of my haunting. I had heard that James Hillman and Sonu Shamdasani recorded a series of conversations during the last two years of uh, of, uh, Hillman's life, in the two years after the Red Book had been published. And I had heard these were to be forthcoming in a book. What I didn't know was the title of the book. I was quite curious. This is one I wanted to read. And then, in the late spring, I saw a notice of the forthcoming title. Lament of the Dead. Psychology after Jung's Red Book. And I received my copy in August, shortly after that dream in the desert. But before getting the book, for a few months before that... (coughs) I had been playing in my imagination with that title. I had a pretty good idea what it referred to in Jung's Red Book. I was wondering about these conversations on that subject. And when I finally got the book, it proved pretty much to go in the direction I thought it might. And we're going to talk about that tomorrow morning. You know, Jung and the Dead. Jung and the Dead. I I don't think you can read his biography, his biographical memoir, Memories, Dreams, Reflections, without noting the intensity of Jung's sense of uh, association with the past, with history, and with the dead. This was apparent to me from the beginning of my own encounter with Jung a long time ago. Dr. Shamdasani gave a summary account of this connection with the dead. And I'll just read that. This is from his introduction in the Red Book, to the Red Book. Shamdasani says, Jung had a sense of living in two centuries and felt a strong nostalgia for the 18th century. His sense of duality took the form of two alternating personalities, which he dubbed number one and number two. Number one was the Basel schoolboy who read novels. Number two pursued religious reflections and solitude in a state of communion with nature and the cosmos. He inhabited God's world. This personality felt most real. Personality number one wanted to be free of the melancholy and isolation of personality number two. When personality number two entered, it felt as if a long, dead, yet perpetually present spirit had entered the room. Number two had no definable character. He was connected to history, particularly with the Middle Ages. Number one, with his failings and ineptitudes, was someone to be put up with. The interplay ran throughout Jung's life. As he saw it, we all are like this. Part of us lives in the present, and the other part is connected to the centuries. Our experience, observation, included, encompassed both realms. But, you know, of course, there was, there, was, there was more to Jung's impression of this otherness. As I have mentioned in past talks, Jung's mother saw spirits. Jung's mother had a sense of ghosts walking around the house at night. And this scared young Dr. Jung quite a bit. At night, he said that his, some, that his mom seemed something like a witch. 
And then, of course, there's the story of his paternal grandfather, his mother's father, who was the uh, Antistis, the, the head of the clergy in Basel. And he was a, a noted Hebraic scholar. Uh, Antistes Pricefork used to have Jung's mother sit behind him when he was writing his sermons to keep spirits from walking behind him while he was writing his sermons and disturbing him. Jung knew this. Uh, Jung wrote in a letter late in life, he said, quote, I have, I have always suspected that my blessed grandfather laid a very strange egg into my mixture. Because his grandfather had been a visionary. He talked to spirits. And then as a young medical student, around age 20, Jung had become involved with his cousin, Heli Pricefork, another ancestor of grandfather Pricefork, the visionary Antistes of Basel. Heli, at age 14 and 15, proved to be a very talented medium. And she used to hold seances, to which members of the family came, communicating with the dead, including grandfather Pricefork, who had died 10 years before Jung was born. And Jung went to these, uh, these seances. He kept notes, and in fact, from his notes and his interactions over a period of a couple of years with Helle, he wrote his doctoral dissertation. That was the subject of his first published work. Now, this seems peculiar to our age, but a fascination with spiritualism and mediumship was very much part of the late 19th century culture, and it was a subject of interest to psychology of that time. Psychical, psychical research was being engaged by many of the finest minds of that age. And a long list of leading psychologists during this epoch frequented mediums. William James included. And Paula has given you a beautiful reading tonight from William James. He had taken note of the subject, and he wrote on the subject, as did many others, including a fellow by the name of Theodore Flournoy. And Theodore Flournoy is, is, is a name many of you won't know much about, but he was a study also, he, he was a doctor in Geneva studying somnambulism. And he wrote a book about a, a medium. Um, it's called... Uh, I'm not it's called uh, From India to the Planet Mars. It was published in 1899, the same year as Freud's interpretation of dreams. The difference was Freud's interpretation of dreams sold hardly any copies at the time of its publication. Flournoy's book, Flournoy's book was a bestseller. And it was one of the books that a basis upon which, model upon which Jung based his doctoral dissertation. Flournoy went on to become a uh, respected colleague, older colleague, an intellectual friend of Jung's, and he was very influential on him throughout his life. In fact, one could say that intellectually and by nature of his interests, Flournoy was closer to Jung than Freud ever was, and Jung said as much in writing. Psychologists of that epoch were interested in the strange thing called psyche. What was it? Was it like the historically conceived soul, a thing that had existed apart from physicality, a fact that even survived death? And how did psychic communication take place? How could dreams, premonitions, or visions actually show real events that were happening elsewhere, even far away, or that were had in advance of events? You know, when I was, let's throw this in, when I was 11 years old, I had a precognitive dream. Um, and I remember the dream. I remember thinking of the dream before the event happened, very briefly before it, remembering the dream because I was sitting in a place and then the entire thing happening when I was 11 years old. That was a shocking experience and it opened my perception to the fact that weird stuff goes on. I had no context for it 
But believe me, I remember the day, I remember sitting with my cousins beside my grandma's house, I remember the dream, I remember the things they were talking about, I remember recalling the dream, and then I remember them relating the things that, that were in the dream. Um, and it was not just deja vu, it was, it was really much more than that. It happens. How do we explain such things? How do we? How do we now? These were questions being asked then. Observers of the 19th century, like some very intelligent observers in current scientific society, in consciousness studies, observed, observed psychic experiences that defied rational explanation. We really do not know what psyche or soul is. It might be reasonable at this point in history to accept the limitations of our understanding and simply start thinking anew. And you know, that was the conclusion of some of the wisest men of the time a hundred years ago, including people like William James. So now we come to the end of this meditation, to the Red Book. I've talked about Jung's Red Book at length in past years, and I won't try to do a summary. Let me just read a little bit of what Shamdasani said, his succinct summary description of the book. He says, quote, Libra Novus presents a series of active imaginations working together with Jung's attempt to understand their significance. This work of understanding encompasses a number of interlinked threads, an attempt to understand himself and to integrate and develop the various components of his personality, an attempt to understand the structure of the human personality in general, an attempt to understand the relation of the individual to present-day society and to the community of the dead an attempt to understand the psychological and historical effects of Christianity, and an attempt to grasp the future religious development of the West. End quote. You know, at the very beginning of his journey in November 1913, as Jung engaged the imaginal world, his soul told him, Look into your depths. Pray to your depths. Waken the dead. Take pains to waken the dead. Dig deep mines and throw in sacrificial gifts so that they reach the dead. As Jung contemplated the fantasies that were arising spontaneously, he commented, and this is in November about of 1913, when this was all just starting. He said, I held a sanctified form and didn't want to allow the chaos to break through its dams. I believed in the order of the world and hated everything disorganized and unformed. End quote. But as this visionary journey went on, Increasingly from December through January of 1914, the chaos built. And then finally on the night of January 18th of 1914, a little over a hundred years ago, he says, all the walls dropped. And he looked into the absolute depth of psychic chaos. Jung stated, and I quote, this is the night in which all the dams broke, where what was previously solid moved, and where the stones turned into serpents, and everything living froze. I noted the 100th anniversary of that date last month. It was just a little bit after our seminar. I hadn't thought about it until that night 
And then I sat after midnight reading these sections of the Red Book where he says, all the dams broke. All the dams broke. And it was shaking. It was a chilling and a deeply moving experience. I have an idea what the man saw. Let me just read you a bit of that. It's actually the prelude, the prelude to that night when all the dams broke. It's the night before, January 17th. And you know, I'll tell you, as I was preparing this lecture, I'd forgotten some of this text. And at the end of this text, I found the answer to my dream. And I didn't really realize where it was until I sat down last Saturday night in a stream of consciousness and wrote all that other stuff that I just read you. I I wrote all that down in about two and a half hours after dinner when I threw the other lecture in the trash. So let me just read you this. He calls this Nox Segunda, the second night. It was the second night of his deep encounter with the dead. And I read... I can no longer say that this or that goal should be reached or that this or that reason should apply because it is good. Instead, I grope through mist and night. No line emerges, no law appears. Instead, everything is thoroughly and convincingly accidental as a matter of fact, even terribly accidental. And suddenly, to your shivering horror, it becomes clear to you that you have fallen into the boundless, the abyss, the inanity of eternal chaos. It rushes towards you as if carried by the roaring wings of a storm, and the hurtling waves of the sea. Every man has a quiet place in his soul where everything is self-evident and easily explainable, a place to which he likes to retire from the confusing possibilities of life, because there everything is simple and clear, with a manifest and limited purpose. And even this place is a smooth surface, an everyday wall, nothing more than a snugly sheltered and frequently polished crust over the mystery of chaos. If you break through this most every day of walls, the overwhelming stream of chaos will flood in. Chaos is not single, but an unending multiplicity. It is not formless, otherwise it would be single, but it is filled with figures that have a confusing and overwhelming effect due to their fullness. These figures are the dead. Not just your dead. That is, all the images of the shapes you took in the past, which your ongoing life has left behind, but also the thronging dead of history. the ghostly procession of the past, which is an ocean compared to the drops of your own life span. I see behind you, behind the mirror of your eyes, the crush of dangerous shadows, the dead, who look greedily through the empty sockets of your eyes, who moan and hope to gather up through you all the loose ends of the ages, which sigh in them. Your cluelessness does not prove anything. Put your ear to that wall and you will hear 
the rustling of this procession. What you exclude from your life, what you renounced and damned, everything that was and could have gone wrong awaits you behind that wall before which you sit quietly. When the time has come and you open the door to the dead, your horrors will afflict your brother, for your countenance proclaims the disaster. Hence, withdraw and enter solitude. Since no one can give you counsel if you wrestle with the dead, do not cry for help if the dead surround you. Otherwise, the living will take flight, and they are your only bridge to the day. Live the life of the day and do not speak of the mysteries, but dedicate the night to bringing about the salvation of the dead. For whoever well-meaningly tears you away from the dead has rendered you the worst service since he has torn your life branch from the tree of divinity. He also sins against restoring what was created and later subjugated and lost. Then turn to the dead. Listen to their lament and accept them with love. Be not their blind spokesman. There are prophets who in the end have stoned themselves. But we seek salvation. And hence we need to revere what has become. And to accept the dead. Who have fluttered through the air and lived like bats under our roofs since time immemorial. The new will be built on the old. And the meaning of what has become will become manifold. Your poverty in what has become, you will thus deliver into the wealth of the future. What seeks to distance you from Christianity and its holy rule of love are the dead, who could find no peace in the Lord since their uncompleted work has followed them. A new salvation is always restoring the previously lost. Dixit Libra Novus. There it was. That was what I was feeling. That's what that dream meant to me out there in the desert. In a way, it took me six months to dig it out, to think about it. That was what I meant. For whoever well-meaningly tears you away from the dead has rendered you the worst service. Since he has torn your life branch from the tree of divinity, he also sins against restoring what was created and later subjugated and lost. And then, over the last few days, as I was thinking about that and putting together other thoughts for this lecture, I ran into something else, a very similar text, another new book written 2,000 years ago. This is the Gospel of Philip. It's found in the Najamati Library, it's a Gnostic text. Somehow that thought seemed about the same issue. Heirs to the living are alive. And they inherit both the living and the dead. If a dead person inherits the living, the living will not die. And the dead 
will come to life. And so, folks, those are my meditations upon a dream in the desert. And so tomorrow morning, bright and all too early for some of us, we will descend with James Hillman and Sono Shamdasani into an audience with the dead. In those last two years of Hillman's life, And those first two years after publication of the Red Book, they had one of the most extraordinary conversations about psychology. And they called it Lament of the Dead. Psychology after Jung's Red Book. Is this book a dividing line in psychology, in psychological history? What a title. Psychology after the Red Book? That's a line that divides things? Well, tomorrow we're going in the morning to consider that discussion and what, indeed, they thought about this lament of the dead, this remembering of the dead. And throughout the day, we'll continue that discussion and move on into a few other related and perhaps even more living subjects. So thank you very much. And you're welcome, if you have any questions or discussion, to add them in. I just wanted to uh, mention that um, uh, on, on a related note, I'm the executive producer of a new film that's coming out, and we're going to premiere it next week. And it's based loosely on William James' variety of religious experience. It's written by a screenwriting professor at the University of Utah named Paul Larson. Some of you may know Paul. Uh, But we're premiering it at the um, Utah Museum of Fine Arts a week from tonight. So uh, it's called Spirituality for the Uninsured. Uh, (laughs) And Paul, the producer-director, was inspired in no small part by William James' variety of religious experience in in, um, developing his themes for this and I, I should add also, I'm not a psychologist. I'm a, I'm a doctor. I'm a historian. Doctors listen to histories. I'm interested in human history because human history helps you make a diagnosis. It gives you a prognosis. It gives you a prescription. It's the most important thing in understanding an illness. And I see a lot of illness in our age. This history of Jung and his experience and the past all the way back through the dead is a history that helps us understand a problem, an illness, something of our age. There's been all this over the years, this talk about uh, you know, Jung and Freud. And a fellow by the name of Eugene Taylor, who was a, one of the leading authorities, I think, uh, leading modern scholars of William James, uh, he just died last year, uh, and, and, and Sonu Shamdasani were the two people who really noted that you got it all wrong if you think Jung came from Freud. Jung's close association was William James. William James and that group of thinkers of the late 19th century, these were the people who were asking the questions. There's another fellow by the name of Frederick Meyer who was asking basically, what is the soul? And does it survive death? There are many people in the early psychological community, and I mentioned Theodore Flournoy, were asking these sorts of questions. And they they were a group that were very much in contact with William James. And now there is actually a movement in uh, consciousness studies, and this is something I had once thought I might talk about tomorrow, but I'm not going to. Um, There's a book recently published called The Irreducible Mind. And you know what these guys did? They went back and looked at the work of, of, of Frederick Meyer a hundred years ago. And the questions he was asking in a book he, call, he published called Human Personality in 1902 and said these are the questions that consciousness studies has not yet answered. 
This book, The Irreducible Mind, is, uh, I think, 800 pages long. Every contributor to this volume is an academic at a major university in America. The main staff that did it were at the University of Virginia. And they were saying, look, these are the questions about psyche that consciousness studies is not approaching, including things like persistence of the soul after death, near-death experiences, things like that. Things of the sort that William James was looking at in a variety of religious experience. Didn't, didn't Jung and Freud come and join James yeah. in the early 20th century? Yeah, the it was first not, time they all met, and they yeah. were at a Clark. No. At Clark University in 1909, and you know when, and, and William James was there, and and that was one of the first times that that was the first time Jung actually sat down with William James. But you know when they invited Freud and Jung, they actually invited Jung and Freud. <coughs> this is a point that that Eugene Taylor makes very clear in in, in his paper. It's called uh, Jung Before Freud. It was published in 1998 in the Journal of Analytical Psychology. It's a brilliant paper. And he really went through and looked at this and says, if you look at this, in America, it was Jung, not Freud. And it was the stuff he was doing on the association experiments. These were the things that really met with American psychology in the early part of the last century. Freud was really not the person they had invited primarily. It was you know, that was the figure they knew in America in 1909 at Clark University. They gave them both degrees. Um, do you understand that the uh, image that you showed us that was the last one mm-hmm. that you know, came in for the Red Book? You talked about that as being unfinished. Um, was it unfinished, or was that what it was meant to be? Well... This is how it was finished. Yes. And so, as I look at that, and then as I listen to um, your presentation this evening, as I reflect on it, um, I was thinking about the collective unconscious, and I was thinking about the dead populating that collective unconscious, and how that may emerge into our lives today. You know, when I first saw the picture, I did not think of it as unfinished, to be honest with you. Subsequently, I heard it described by Dr. Shamdasani as unfinished. Um, It is actually the last page he did in the Red Book. The transcription really finished that he did at that time finish at this point. I've looked at it several times because I think it's a very meaningful picture. This is really what Jung was dealing with. There is this mystery in the midst of humanity. And some people were aware of it. Some people were concentrating their interests in it. Some people were oblivious to it. And some people were actively turning their back at it. Isn't yeah. it always going to be unfinished? I mean, whether yeah. you think that Jung never got to complete painting or not, this one way. it's always unfinished. Right, right. It's like the collective unconscious would always be something in some kind of fluid motion, and even the dead, some of those dead, could turn toward the mystery or away. <clears throat> this is another thing that hit me <clears throat> when I was going through all this stuff. You know, lament of the dead. Mormonism is a cult of the dead. I mean, I, you know, I was going up to this cemetery with my my aunt Jane, who was named after the second polygamous wife. She's named after the first and second polygamous wife of her of her father. Going up to the cemetery with Aunt Jane, you know, doing the Mormon cemetery thing on on Memorial Day. All these people are up there, their families, people that camp out by gravestones in a Mormon cemetery on Memorial Day just to meet their ancestors. People do that, you know, in Utah. I've met a few of them. My ancestors, as a matter of fact. Well, don't they want to baptize the dead? I mean, the dead are not dead. Because, you know, the Mormon temple ceremony is, is the ritual is really a service to the dead. Rituals are done for the salvation of the dead. And so as I was thinking about going to those old cemeteries, I mean, up in Willard and Brigham City, my family's family's cemetery, yeah, it gets complicated. It gets 
crowded. It gets crowded. Yeah. I'm just going to use the word chaos. Is there any message about word chaos? Does it kind of enter into any of And is the chaos, as I'm looking at this image, the mystery, the divine mystery aspect doesn't look chaotic. No. Very beautiful. Is the chaos then the unresolved consciousness that we, once we become aware of it, are responsible to? Is that the chaos? I'm going to try to uh, open it up for a discussion of that tomorrow after lunch. That is a very good question. And this issue of chaos and unity of self, you know, sort of something unifying and glorious and something chaotic and disintegrative, dissociative. That is a big subject, and and it's a very good question. I'm glad you asked that, but I'm going to hold, try to hold my response to that until after lunch tomorrow, because that's what I want to talk about. That's what I had to talk about. Well, I was just reflecting. Um, I, I talked with a couple um, this morning, um, and they have a major issue about how to um, bless their daughter because it's a Mormon and a Baptist tradition, and it's it's become very divisive. Um, and I I was thinking about when it comes to the dead, that's another divisive issue. Who claims the dead? What tradition claims the dead? And what traditions can claim the dead of other traditions? And what, yes. But even more important. <laughs> but but even more important. And this is where I I start. What tradition did the dead claim? Yeah, that's a good question. That's what I've been dealing with for a long time. Uh-huh. <clears throat> Let's hope they have a choice. I, in my impression, they have a choice. In a movie I was watching last night, one of the characters said, "Die two deaths. One is the, the first death. The first death is the death of our physical body. The second death is when the last person alive speaks your name." And, and I was uh, thinking about the resurrection of Young's name over the last. Probably 40, 30, 40, 50, well, in my experience, over the last, say, 25, 30 years. And his name is just now, I mean, again, it's just everywhere. So. I said I'm a historian. I'm interested in history. I'm, I'm interested in a particular type of history. I'm interested in people who see visions, people who have imaginative, visionary experience. This has been my interest. And it probably has something to do with the fact that I have a family who have been hooked up with the Mormon tradition for a good long time. I had a few questions about this stuff, about what was going on, and they weren't answered in ways that are traditional, shall we say, uh, folk tradition of, of this area. But nonetheless, I was very interested in it. In history, you, you, you ask questions. Sonu said something that I'll, you know we're going to talk about tomorrow. He said, you know, as a historian, you choose who you're going to resurrect, whose name you're going to remember. Hillman is talking about people that he wants to keep alive in memory. And someone says, you know, that's the historical project. But each one of us decides who, who are ours. And mine, you know, it's like, well, it's, I'm, Jung's one of them. Actually, another that I haven't said much about is, is John Ronald Rule Tolkien. And there, there are three people I know a lot about historically. I, I'm, I'm a dilettante. I, my, my, my knowledge is about that thick over a large area, and then it's somewhat substantially deeper when it comes to three subjects. Jung, Joseph Smith, and John Ronald Rule Tolkien. That, that's where I am. So that I've been wanting to ask you about this, and that fits perfectly. I personally don't have... Um, a difficult time with the psychologists or philosophers who emphasize the rational Mm -hmm. as long as I can understand that that's a point of view that's good to look at. But what seems so special about Jung among, among his peers is that he did have these talents that I think a lot of people have but a lot of scholarly types and people who like the rational don't have. 
or maybe they're suppressing. So my understanding of Jung is that it wasn't just his, his grandfather and his mother and his cousin, but he himself. And that there, there are several items that I remember in particular that I thought were really exciting. Like there's a night when a whole crowd of Jewish people come into the house and he's not the only one who experiences them, but like they're out in the hallway and people are asleep and the young family are waking up, like I don't know if this, his son or young, and that wherever he traveled, he would find himself being awakened by the dead in like rooms in England, say, and it's the 1940s or 50s. It's not just when he was a kid. Yeah, there was a story like that from the, yeah, when he's in England, a haunted house. Yeah. And, and so, you, I, like, I, there are rationalists that need it to be a certain way, and deeper it seems like that. And I even like the idea of what Miller says, where he's saying, entertain the ideas, bring these ideas in, and let, you know, let them bug you, and get, see what you get out of them, don't reject them. And then you have someone like Jung, who is, has this great, brilliant mind, but he's also somehow, he's psychic, right? He's in touch with he's other in, realms. He's in touch with the psyche, and I don't think it was by choice. It, I mean, it wasn't something he went looking for. It, it was, I don't know, fate. I guess some people just have the fate of being involved in such things. You know, like I, I, fate, destiny. Destiny. Maybe they're the same. Who knows? And I just want to end it. The scientist, for me, and this has been sort of my thing all my life, is the scientist is open to all of that, right? The true skeptic and falsification person and person who wants to really understand the world has to be open to the, the stuff that the rationalist thinks is freaky. Right, and that, that's this, the book Irreducible Mind, that's really its point. It's like, okay, consciousness study, sure, fine, except do not exclude evidence. And that, oh, man, I wish I, th- there's a William James quote I had in my paper, or maybe I had it in something tomorrow, which is exactly that. Whatever you're doing, whatever your position, let's not narrow our evidence to fit what we want to find. And he really, and James actually said that, I'm recalling now, about this fellow F. H. W. Meyer, who wrote Human Personality, 1902. And Meyer's real question was, does the soul survive death? But this guy asks the question in these incredibly rational ways, taking evidence from human experience, well-documented experience, and he was with all these other guys in the psychical research, including people like James, and a, a list of psychologists whose names I won't repeat because I don't remember them, and you don't remember them either. But this was it. Don't exclude the evidence. And there is evidence in human experience of some rather extraordinary things that are not sometimes explained. I, saw, I should step back and say, look, you know, I, I think I understand Giedrich. I understand his reasoning. And it is very clean within its domain. I understand where he's going. I understand why he's thinking that way. I just simply don't agree because it does not take into account all the knowledge. And what it really does is cuts out human history. He's done with history and he's done with me. That's old. And it's not old to me. Well, as, as you were talking about Giedrich, I was wondering does Giedrich um, say that um, does he diminish the possibility, the reality of pure experience? Yeah. Because he's never allowed himself to go there? Well, that is a question of a clinical nature that I couldn't answer. But basically what he says is, you know, these things happen. It's not like that they don't happen. I would not say that Giedrich doesn't accept such things happen. But he sees them as a form of our thought process. The difference is, does this happen and does it exist as an objective fact to which your mind, your reason comes in contact, or is it all an epiphenomena of your thought? And that's his complaint of Jung, is that Jung, he says he's a, you know, he's a positivist. He's allowing the image to have its own reality. It's not, he says, you know, the problem is, is Jung can't think hard enough to see that this is really just his thought, 
and he has to bring it back into his thought structure, sublate it, you know, negate it, and bring it back into, in, into his rational structure. Where Jung is saying, you know, this stuff is outside of me, it's not part of my thought, it's a, well, almost a separate, a dualistic reality. That's what it comes down to with Degrick and positivism. It's dualism. It comes back to this idea, he saw her. Mind, conception. Mind, thought. Image and thought. Logos, rational power, Sophia, the experience. But the experience itself is something real. And that's what Gigrich, in his review, just makes clear again and again and again and again. There's only thinking. All this image stuff is really Jung thinking. It's all, he's making it up. It's all part of things he's seen. None of it is really, as he's making it, seen, independent. And he says it all really comes. He's just a very learned man. He knows all this stuff about mythology. He's just sort of, by cryptomnesia, re- reconfigured these things. And he's deceiving us, and maybe even deceiving us on, a, on purpose in doing this. Hillman, and, Hillman had an absolutely diametrically opposed opinion, and we'll talk about that tomorrow. And, of course, Sham Dasani does too, and I do too. But that's, you know, that's the stuff I've studied. That's the stuff I've looked at. That's the stuff I care about. And I have, hey, I have my standpoint. But Jung did want to keep it private, right? There wasn't a point where he said, look, please publish this, but he, wait so many years after I died. He did feel that this was like... He wanted it published. He did want it published? Yeah. Throughout the book, this is something that Sham Dasani has been asked a zillion times and, and asked himself, you know. And throughout the book, Jung addresses an audience. He says, my friends. He says, you. He talks to an audience throughout this book. And it's clear that he wanted to publish. In the 1920s, he really is thinking about publishing, and he's actually having discussions with a woman by, um, that I've mentioned to you before by the name of Baines, Carrie Baines. And Carrie kept a journal of her conversations with Jung in the early 20s. And he was in having considerations about how do you publish this. And he came to the conclusion how you publish it is you don't publish it in this day and age. It was the right. It was the only right decision. Can you imagine what this book would have? What would have happened to this book if he would have? What would have happened to Jung if he would have published this in 1920? If he would have published this without any of the other 40 years of work in 1920, what would have happened? Sonu. So he gave this lecture in in Los Angeles, and it's right when the Red Book came out. They had the big show in Los Angeles. The room it was a big auditorium. At, I think UCLA. The place was full. You know, 800 people. And Sonu gives up and gives this talk. And it's a he, he's giving the talk as if it's the story of him going into a bookstore in Paris and asking the owner of the bookstore for a copy of this obscure book which had been published in the 1920s by a fellow whose name was uh, 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 Jung. And the fellow in the books, and, the, and he isn't giving any clue to what he's doing. He just gives up and starts talking. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a, you know on a fall day, I walked into a bookstore in Paris, and, and you know, and the bookstore owner uh, says, "Oh yes, that book. That's strange. A uh, bit related to the Dadaist stuff, wasn't it? Why, why would you want a copy of that that old thing? Uh, oh, we might have one back in the back room somewhere. Hardly anyone asked for that. Don't you want something else?" He went through this long sort of drama of what would have happened. And that is what would have happened. No one would have understood this. In fact, right now, people are having trouble. It took a lot of time, of 40 years of thinking, and maybe you know, 80, 100 years now, of considering nature of human nature to get a perspective on what this book might have been. But he did want to publish. That's really clear. Um, in fact, he even thought about publishing in the 1940s. Uh, Mary Mellon, who's the Mellon family, are the uh, Paul Mellon and such are the people behind the, the National Gallery of Art in Washington D.C. The Mellon family had some bucks, still do. And Mary Mellon sponsored the Bullingdon Foundation that published Jung's collected works. And he had actually apparently talked to Mary Mellon, uh, uh, and even tried to get her a copy of this to consider publishing it. And then when Memories, Dreams, Reflections, his autobiography was in preparation in the 1957, he gave a copy. In fact, he had Carrie Baines give her copy of the Red Book, and many people had these copies, to the guy who, the publisher, whose name was Kurt Wolf of Pantheon Books, so that he could see the Red Book, because when they were doing Memories, Dreams, Reflections, when Anneli Afi was doing, putting together this transcript, he gave her rights to use 
this or in the memories, dreams, reflections if she wished. And each and every one of these times, people decided not to use it. Why? How the hell are you going to explain this? Where, how do you integrate this into anything else? I mean, Sham Dasani's had this idea that there are lots of copies of the Red Book floating around. And there were. There were several people that had copies of this. But no one seemed to be sharing it, and no one was talking about it. Hand, hand done copies? Huh. That, that TypeScript. Did, like, oh. what he had, when Jung did the TypeScript, uh, first he did it by hand, and then he had the whole, the first manuscript draft that he did in 1914 typed up by Tony Wolfe. She typed it. And then that TypeScript he gave to at least six or seven other people. So to they read. Didn't the, they didn't have the, the paintings. The paintings didn't exist at that time. All he had was the typescript. I mean, the paintings, in 1915, he had the manuscript, the words. It took him 16 more years to create that. All the, and, the, and all the calligraphy. Yeah, he spent 16 years working on that after the manuscript was essentially done. And the manuscript, he was passing around. And people were actually looking at it. There are letters between him and people who had read it. Many people had it. I mean, you know, probably a dozen people had copies up through the last days of, you know, his life. I mean, the book itself was in his office, and there were dozens of people who saw the book. They didn't read it because, I mean, hey, it's this calligraphy. You'd sit there, but people, you know, flipped through and saw the book pages. They knew it was there. And some people actually had the manuscript. In fact, uh, Marie-Louise Lanfranc had the complete, you know, manuscript. And there's really a question as to, you know, was she showing this to anybody? And I know one of her close disciples, who, you know, he's now in his 80s, who was really close to Marie Louise Honfrantz. And I asked him, because I, knowing that she had the manuscript, I, I asked him, did she ever tell you she had this? And this is after, this is last year, after the Red Book was published. And he said she never mentioned it to me. People, I mean, this is somebody that she knew as well as anybody. Somebody that spent 50 years involved with Jung's psychology, who was a head of the Jung Institute, who was a dear friend, and she never mentioned it to him. That's how private this thing was kept at a certain point. But Jung had not meant to keep it entirely private. And so when he left it to his family, he did leave it without instructions. I mean, the old man just said, It'll happen when it happens. Yeah. It'll happen when it happens. I mean, he could not plan it out. But if it would have happened before now, I don't think it would have gone well. <clears throat> right now, it's, I mean, you know, people like Giegrich call it, you know, careless scribbles. That's what it is. Maybe it is. It's, it's opinion. I'll allow that. Okay. Let's get together tomorrow morning and talk about the lament of the dead. Thank you. Thank you.